get your Bibles. Let's open to Luke 15. Um, in our study in the book of Luke, we're not, we're not at chapter 15 yet. We did jump ahead because of Easter to get to the story, but then went back. Um, and I was looking at the scene where we were in here and, and uh, could not get away from this passage today of Luke 15. And so there's obviously a reason why we come to the story of the prodigal son today and the message that's been on my heart, particularly with this story for years, last few years, but could not let it go for this week. And we'll have to back up uh, uh, next week. But just need to share the story. But before I do, um, I want to share with you uh, the last two nights I've had dreams um, where revival was beginning to break out uh, around us. And if you don't know what revival is, uh, it's the idea of just a mass movement of God in an area or in a country. The Bible does talk about the last days that uh, people will dream dreams and see visions and that revival will take place. Um, in Clark County, uh, there is such a battle uh, for, for the souls and the hearts of the people around us. Um, the drug issue and others are just massive here in Clark County. And the last two nights just, just felt a stirring even while I slept. It's one of those weird moments where you know you're dreaming, but you understand that, that there's an encouragement in it, that God wants to bring about revival for this area. And one reason I'm excited about today, because it is what we're going to talk about today, God's kindness that draws us to repentance and can change the world and the world around us. And so I ask of you this week, uh, in your prayer life, every time you pray, to remember to ask God to send revival uh, right here in Clark County, maybe right here in this church, and may it start here, that our hearts would be back on fire for the things of God. Luke chapter 15, that was just a commercial. Luke chapter 15, it's, it's a story uh, about lost things. Most of the time we hear about it as lost things. A, a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Uh, and the lost son, the most common name for that story is what? The prodigal son. So you've been around a while, you've heard that. The prodigal son. And usually when these stories are taught, and it's not wrong to teach it this way, we focus on the things that are lost. And in the story of the prodigal son, we have a boy who decides that he wants to do his own thing, and he asks his dad for money, and he takes off and takes his money and squanders it, which is one of the definitions of prodigal, to be wasteful. So that's why this name has come to connect with this. The word prodigal is not in the story. It's something we've added. It's about the wasteful son. And we talk about it in terms of our sin and our wantonness to, to wander away and walk away from the things of God. And that's often the way it's taught. And there's nothing wrong with that part of the story, but I think there's so much more. And, and if you'll look with me for just a minute, I want to read the essential part of the story. And so Luke chapter 15, Jesus has already told two other parables about a shepherd who lost a sheep. And Jesus says, you know, why wouldn't you go out and look for the one? If you had 100 sheep and lost one, you leave the 99, go look for the one. A woman had 10 coins. She lost the coin, so she lit a lantern, got her broom out, and swept the whole house until she found it. And she found the lost coin. And then he gets to this story about a lost son. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he, the dad, divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to become impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Ugh, who would do that? <clears throat> anyway, and he, and he would gladly fill... If you're a visitor here, we have a hog farmer in the midst. That's what I'm talking about. 
And verse 16, And he would gladly fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up, I will go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up. He came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again and was lost as has been found. And they began to celebrate. We're going to stop there. So here's a story. If you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard this story. And we focus on the destructive living of, of the young man. And here's the thing that I want us to really grasp. Literally, this one chapter I could preach all afternoon and probably into tomorrow. But Lord bless you, then it's not going to happen today. There's so many things in this. And again, parable, almost the word the, uh, para, being beside, and ball, to throw down. Throw down beside. So he, he throws down the story alongside the truth of, of God and us. And so as we see the story, we understand the interaction between the dad and the boy. We can see our interaction between us and God. And so he's, he's telling a parable He's throwing this story down alongside our truth of our life to teach a point. And the question I think that we have to ask is this. Why was Jesus teaching the story? That is so crucial for us to understand the real message of this. What I want you to do is go back to the beginning of chapter 15. And I want, to, want you to see what precipitates these stories of the lost things. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him, Jesus, to listen to him. Now we all know tax collectors are sinners. We just know that, right? IRS, no, I'm just kidding. Back then they were, they were crooks. And so they lumped them in, all tax collectors and sinners. I don't know if that means the tax collectors were worse and sinners were everybody else. They said the tax collectors and sinners were doing what? They were coming near to Jesus. Well, that wasn't the only problem. Verse 2, both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Verse 3, so he told them this parable, saying. That word so is the... Major word here. So, he told them this parable. So is a connecting ver word like therefore. Therefore, because that happened, this is going to happen. So, because what they said, I want to tell you the story. What was the complaint of the scribes and Pharisees? That there were sinners? No, that wasn't the problem. What was the problem? That he was eating with them. That he was hanging out with them. That he was loving on them. That he cared about them. That he would dare spend time with these wretched people. The issue was not that there were sinners, but how Jesus treated the sinners. That was what their problem was. So, Jesus told these stories. They were mad about how he was loving on these wretched people. Because they were mad that he was loving them, he told the story. So let me suggest to you, this has nothing, no, I shouldn't say nothing, it does not have as much to do with the things that are lost as those who are looking for them. That's the issue in this story. It's not about the sheep, one of a hundred that was lost, it's about the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one. It's not about a coin that is lost, it's about the woman who tears her whole house apart to find that one lost coin. It's about those who are looking, not about those who are lost, primarily. So it's about the shepherd, it's about the woman, and it's about the dad, not about the son. Now it's interesting that prodigal means wasteful 
or extravagant, and that boy certainly lived that. One of my favorite definitions I looked up in the dictionary is, and they gave an illustration, it says, the dessert was prodigal with whipped cream. It means a washing, slathered with whipped cream. They had me at that. Glory to God, right? The dessert was prodigal with whipped cream. That I get. I, and their phrase was, it was a wash in whipped cream. In fact, you know, there was antonyms, greedy versus a generous. A prodigal is somebody who's generous. Mean and kind. A kind is a prodigal. And so it's not just wasteful, but it's being extravagant in, in love and good things. So this really could be called the prodigal father. Because he was lavish, he, he was awash in grace and forgiveness. Now, please, if you got a pen or pencil, I want you to look at verse 3 and circle the word so. And then the, verses, the verse right above, this man receives sinners and needs them so, he told them this parable. Do not lose sight of that verse as we unfold the story a little bit. Jesus teaches the prodigal father so that people would understand it's not just Jesus that feels this way about sinners. His dad feels this way about sinners. And if we may get personal, his dad feels that way about you. Now, it's been one of the most amazing things in my ministry because it starts with me. I have the hardest time convincing people that God really likes them. I do. But sometimes I have a really hard time convincing myself that God likes me. I, I ask people, and, I, and this came from a series of lessons I taught, and uh, I taught it at Fuel, I taught it all over, and I would ask the class, do you believe that in, in Christ you are forgiven by God? Mm-hmm. Do you believe because of that that you are accepted by God? Mm-hmm. And then I said, do you think God likes you? Hand comes down. We're not really sure he likes us. He forgives us because that's what he does. But does he really like us? I, I don't really think so, we say. That's pretty much the whole purpose of this story that Jesus teaches. To show us that God really does like us. Not just accepts, but likes. We're going to unpack that a little bit, but understand what's going on here. The boy takes his money, and he goes, and he blows it. Now, the money was his father's, but the money was given to him to do what he wanted with. Our lives, our resources, our skills, our heart, our mind, everything about us has given us to do what we want. And we can go to a distant land, and we can squander those things outside of the father's care if we want. He's not gonna, he did not stop his son from doing that. Notice in the story, he also didn't go look for the boy to drag him back home. Like we might have done. He doesn't, go, he doesn't go there to get him, to bring him home. He waits for the boy to come back. This is about the dad, not about the boy. We understand quite easily who the boy is. It's us. And I, I just want to notice something here. If you take and look in your Bibles, verse 13, his journey takes him into a distant country. It's interesting that Jesus, I don't think there's any misuse of words anywhere in this story. When we walk away from God, we, walk, it's a di we become far away, distant from him. And it says he, he spends his money on, and, on everything, and it says severe famine occurred in the country, and he became impoverished. We also find out that he becomes depressed and downtrodden, that he becomes broken and lonely. That is the promise of what you will receive if you walk with the enemy. You'll be far away from your God. You'll become impoverished and famined. You will become uh, desperate and alone. That is all the enemy can offer you. He, got, he can offer you a party for a little while. He, got, he spent his money, had his fun. But then, and I'm not talking about a famine of food 
or an impoverishment of money. I'm talking about a famine of the soul, an impoverishment of the Spirit of God. And the boy understands that he is, he is certainly not at home. And things at home are much better than they are here. And we see an absolutely incredible story take place. The boy decides that my dad's slaves and servants have it better than I do. They got something to eat at least. And so he, he works on his speech. You ever mess up when you were a kid and work on your speech? I've heard your speeches, John. John worked on speeches pretty much daily. You ever, you ever work on your speech? Well, Dad, you know, I, uh, and we talked a couple weeks about blowing the muffler out in my car, and Dad didn't know for a while how I really did that, and well, we're not going to tell it here either, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I lied to him about what happened to that muffler. I worked on my story. Yeah, I know it's a shock, and I'm not perfect, and it's not good, and it's not right, but we work on our story. In this case, what do I say to my dad? He said, I, I know it. Um, verse 18, I, I will get up and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he's working, okay. Father, I've sinned against you in heaven uh, uh, and I'm not worthy uh, to be your son, so just make me a hired man. And he's working on the speech. He's getting it down. He's, so he gets up and he starts walking home. And I imagine all the way home, He's got his head down because he's, I don't want to see Dad. He's going to be so disappointed in me, so angry at me. And so, Lord, I've, I've, I've sinned against heaven and you, Dad. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I just make me a servant. He's working. He's walking his head down. And he doesn't notice his dad when he gets close enough. But notice his language there. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Why? Because it was based in his mind, our minds, all the time, on our works. I messed up. I blew your inheritance. I lived a way that God does not want me to live. And I'm not worth anything to be called your son. Well, the good news is, as we're going to see here, that we are sons by birth, not by worth. You're a child of God because you're a child of God. Can we be better kids sometimes and worse kids? Well, sure. But that doesn't change his love. We're still his kids. But still, and you know it and I know it, we still think, yeah, but he doesn't like me. He doesn't really love me. He's going to be so upset. And so you come with your head down and you're practicing your speech. And notice what it says, uh, verse 20, but while he was still a long way off. I just like that phrase. Our best work, which is to get up and turn around and come home, our best work only gets us a long way off before God steps in. Isn't that amazing? It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. What does that mean about the dad? It means the dad was looking. I bet every day he would stand outside his house and look down the road where his son walked away and just wondering if, Today, the day he comes home. And the dad was looking and saw him coming. And it says he felt furious anger and indignation. No. What did he feel? Compassion. Why? He knew what happened. It makes no sense. Grace makes no sense. And yet he feels compassion for him. And it says he ran and embraced him and kissed him. In the south, basically, that means he hugged his neck. That's what they say. Let me hug your neck. That involves a kiss, usually, too. Now, in this culture, it was not normal for a father to run. It was almost um, disrespectful, or just wasn't proper for a dad to run. I should have been in that culture. I'm not very good at that anymore. Um, I would suggest to you that this is probably the first time in this boy's life that he ever saw his father run, ever. And I'm sure his first thought was, why is he running at me? Right? 
Because that's where our heart goes. When he finds out what I've done, if he doesn't already know, he's going to clothesline me when he gets here. Can you imagine the other shock and relief and guilt when the father runs up, hugs him, and kisses him? It's not about the boy, it's about the dad. Well, he, he loves sinners, the Pharisee said. So Jesus told him a story. God loves sinners. And so he runs and he embraces him and he kisses him. And the son, oh, I need to get my speech done. And the son said, and Father, I have sinned against heaven and in, and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he doesn't get it finished. And may I suggest to you, it's because the dad wasn't even listening. Like, yeah, whatever. Shh, shh. He doesn't get the part, I'll just be a hired servant. He doesn't even get that out. The dad shuts him down. And he says, uh, uh, he, he, Father says, verse 22, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. I get the distinct impression when I read this that that was coming without the speech. Don't you? Because he didn't get to finish his speech. Now, you and I have a really hard time believing that that would really happen. That the dad would just be furious about us. That God would hate us for what we've done. But Jesus is telling the story so that we know that dad does not feel that way about us. What is most important to dad is that the son of mine, verse 24, was dead and has come back to life, was lost and been found. That's what matters. Not the squandered resources. In fact, he spends more resources on the boy. He gives him a robe, gives him a ring, gives him sandals, and kills the fatted calf. He spends more. Because it, the resources are not the issue. God cares about people. The only thing that we can do to receive the grace that is demonstrated in this story is just to turn around and come back to God. That's all we can do to get forgiven is just to turn around and decide to come home. The dad was not going to come get him and drag him back. God is never going to come drag you and bring you to him. Just not going to happen. But if you decide that you want to turn around and head back towards God... You got a hug your neck moment coming. He's going to love on you. Love on you deeply. And it says that he brought the robe and put it on him. Did the boy ask for a robe? No. Did the boy resist the robe? I don't think he had a choice. Dad said, put the robe on him, put the ring on him, and put sandals on his feet. All those things are symbol that you're not a servant, but a son. The ring is an issue of authority. The slaves were barefoot. The owner and his kids had sandals on. And the robe was a robe from the family. These are all symbols that this boy is, is still my son, not going to be a servant. And it was all done by the father, not by the boy's request. You cannot... You cannot ask nor earn the robe. That is a gift from God. I want you to, I want you to see a verse with me. Go, go with me to Isaiah chapter 61. Go back in your Bibles. If you get to Jeremiah, you're close. It's right before Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 61. Look at Isaiah 61. We're going to look at verse 10. Just an incredible, incredible passage of Scripture. Isaiah 61. 
at verse 10. Isaiah writes, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. And you think, well, if Isaiah's writing this, he's a prophet. It means he's, he's mighty in, in, in the presence of God. He's more liked by God than the rest of us. Therefore, God's better to him. Notice what he says about salvation, his salvation. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord, verse 10, my soul exalted in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. I didn't earn it. He, he clothed me with them. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. There it is. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Righteousness is the work of God alone. Now we're going to talk about obedience and serving the Lord with our whole heart here in a minute. But it is, it is not our works, whether we are worthy or not by what we've done, to earn salvation. Salvation is done solely by the hand of God. By one man came sin into the world, and by one man came righteousness, Jesus Christ. It was not you. You were not the man that brought righteousness onto your head. It was God put the robe on you. And he says, you got dirt and you put seed in it, it is the dirt and the soil that God has created that makes it grow. And so when we come and we put ourselves back in the soil of God, he will grow righteousness in us. We cannot do it on our own. Does, can God really forgive us like this? Can you, can you imagine, I know you can't, the guilt the boy felt, as he's getting clothed in a robe. He was, he was ready to be a slave in his dad's house, and his dad's putting a robe on him. The boy's like, Dad, but you don't know what I've done. And, and they're like, shh, get the ring. But Dad, no, put the ring on me. You won't believe how many prostitutes I was with and how many mistakes I've made. And, and shh, get some shoes on the boy. But Dad, you do not know how I've been living. And he said, oh, and go get the fatted calf and the A1 sauce. We're going to have a party. Can you imagine the guilt the boy felt? And you know he wasn't immediately like, hey, I'm free. He probably walked to the house with his head hanging down. I do not deserve this. Why in the world would dad give me this robe? He just doesn't understand. Once he understands, he is going to let me have it. And not the robe. Probably for this whole, whole feast, he's like, I don't, I don't want to eat any of this. I'm, I'm a mess. Why is this? This isn't for me. This can't be for me. You understand the guilt of sin. God forgives the guilt of your sin. I want you... I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 4 with me for just a moment. We only got a few minutes to do some, some quick study here. 2 Corinthians 4. And then we're going to make some application about our obedience still in the midst of this. You talk about grace and people think, oh, that means we can do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. Mm. Nah, you don't get that here. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Oh, there's so many verses we could read getting up to this. We don't have time. Just, let's just look at verse 6. I'm talking about salvation here. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness. The prodigal boy was darkness, and light shone on him from the Father. Light shall shine out of darkness. The one who said that is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now I've shared this here before. I just want to share it again. The, the story in Exodus 33, we do not have time to turn there, but it's after the Israelites made the golden calf and sinned, and God was going to wipe them all out and start over with Moses. And Moses prays, and God relents from, from his decision and, and grants them grace instead. But Moses is afraid that because God was angry at his people for what they have done, that he would not go with them anymore. 
And God says, I want you to go out. And, and Moses says, you're going to go with us. And, and God says, yes. He said, well, can you give me a sign? He says, can you show me your glory? That is the question Moses asked. Can you show me your glory, God, as a sign that you will go with us? And so Moses is up on the mountain with him, and God says to him, I will show you my glory. I will have my kindness pass before you. My goodness in some versions. And he says, now you will not be able to see my face, because no man has ever seen my face and lived. But I'll show you my glory. I'll let my goodness pass before you. I will show grace to whom I show grace, and I will show compassion to whom I show compassion. Exodus 33. When Moses asked God to show his glory, God says, my glory is my kindness. It is my goodness. It is my grace and compassion. Now often when we think of God, we think of the opposite. He is an angry God wanting to smack our hands. Now he does discipline those whom he loves, as any good parent will. But his glory is his goodness, his grace, and compassion. And look what this verse says. It says, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Christ. The knowledge of the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus. Now, we didn't get to see God's face because we could not survive that. But he has shown himself in Christ, and we have seen his face. And it says, in the face of Jesus, you see my glory. And what did he say his glory was? Grace and compassion. We see the face of Jesus on the cross in our mind. And he looks down at those who are killing him and laughing at him, making fun of him, gambling for his stuff. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine the people doing that to him, hearing him say that to them? They saw the glory of God in the face of Christ, which is his kindness. When Jesus looks at you from the cross as he's dying for your sins and mine, do you see anger or do you see God's kindness? How, how can you not see kindness that he would do that for us? He says the glory of God is seen in the face of Christ. And it's told in the story of the prodigal, lavish father. Now I want you to look a couple of verses because I know you don't believe me. 1 John chapter 4. Near the end of the Bible, right before Revelation, and right before Jude, 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. You're going to read this and think this is not true, but it's in the Bible, so it is. Unlike the internet. If it's on the internet, it is not necessarily true, but in here it is. I am going to blow you away with this verse. I want to read the ones leading up to it. 1 John chapter 4, I want to start at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. There's that whole discussion again. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is in us, perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us, given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We see in his face the glory of God, his kindness. Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Notice that it has nothing to do with our works here, right? We confess that Jesus is our Lord, and God abides in us. And we have come to know, verse 16, and have believed the love which God has for us. Do you believe the love which God has for you, by the way? It's hard sometimes. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now, you know, he says, do you believe the love of God for you? And that is where we struggle, right? It's where I struggle when I make stupid mistakes. And so John knows that. Look what he writes in verse 17. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence, confidence in the day of judgment, because there's that so, that therefore, this is a connecting word, we can have confidence because Jesus died for us, because as he is, Jesus is, so also are we in this world. However Jesus is in this world, we are if we choose Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now I ask you the question, 
Do you think God likes you? Let me ask you this question. Do you think God likes Jesus? Do you think God smiles when he looks at his son? As Jesus is, so also are we in this world. Can I get one amen in here? Isn't that incredible? Colossians 3.3, 3, we don't have time to turn there. It says we are hidden with Christ in God. We're hidden in Christ. Wherever Christ gets, that's where we get. God smiles at his son and therefore he smiles at us. His kindness is, makes absolutely no sense. You know, have you heard the verse, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? You know what follows that? I mean, precedes that? It starts out with, therefore there is no condemnation. And right before that, he talks about Jesus dying for his sins. But right before that, he says, I am an absolute disaster spiritually. Paul says, the things I want to do that I know are right, I can't seem to get them done. And the things I don't want to do that I know are wrong, those are the very things I end up doing. And that says, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this? He says, Jesus Christ. And then he follows that up with, therefore, there is no condemnation. Oh, there has to be condemnation. No, maybe Paul's talking about sin before he came to the Lord. No, he's talking about his spiritual life after his coming to Christ. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those things I end up doing. I'm wretched. All the time I'm wretched. But through Jesus Christ we have hope. Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is absolutely unfair and quite honestly unfathomable. That God would love us that much. To let our sin go. And forgive the guilt of it. Now let me close up by sharing this. When you understand that as horrible as you are, and you know that better than anybody, when it comes to doing what's right and the things you think of, maybe not things you do, but just things you think of are a mess, and God still runs to you if you turn back to him, that is why we obey. That is why we serve. That is why he has my devotion. Not so that I will be saved someday, but because I have been saved from the wretchedness that I am. There is no condemnation. And because of that, he has my heart. He has my soul. Does that mean I have not made mistakes? No, I, I make plenty of them. have made plenty recently. But I care about it. I repent from it. I change the direction that was wrong and try to go where it is right as best I can with his power because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Scripture tells us that we should be like God in this world. The worship team would come up that means that we need to hunt the lost like God did. And you and I both know people that we don't really want to, well, we might want to hunt them, <laughs> but not for salvation purposes. There's people who have, who have sinned and messed up so much that we just can't imagine that there is no condemnation. And there is discipline. God does, not everyone makes it. Not everyone makes it. Because they have to choose Christ. We need to be the kind of people that Jesus shows us in the stories of the lost. We need to be the shepherd. We need to be the woman. We need to be the dad. That we look for and hunt for redemption. And maybe for the rest of you, if you're here this morning and you feel like the prodigal one who's run away and squandered a lot of their lives, all you have to do is make a decision to walk back to him. But you don't, yeah, I do know. And I don't know, but I know. And I will promise you, because Jesus promised, that if you make a decision and get up and walk towards him, he will run to you. And embrace you. And hug your neck and kiss you. And he will put 
the robe of righteousness on you that you are absolutely right. You do not deserve grace. And you'll find your grace with him. For the rest of us, when we understand that he keeps forgiving the guilt of our sin, we have no choice but to give him our whole heart and life, our obedience. Grace is not permission to sin. It's permission to serve out of love. If you haven't made that decision, we're going to sing the song that talks about this. It's called kindness. It's your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. It's your mercy, Lord, that we need. Stand and sing it. If you're ready to give your life to Christ, maybe you just want to come up and have someone pray over you for whatever reason, just struggling. Come on up. Let's sing together. Open up the skies of mercy.